Hello students, welcome to Mr. Sandwich Reads, and I am Mr. Sandwich, and today I'm going to start reading The King of Mulberry Street. Uh, I did record my first reading, but I don't know where that recording went, so here I am again. Uh, if my enthusiasm seems faded, it's only because uh, I lost my recording. Um, but I do really enjoy this book. This is one of my favorite uh, historical fiction books. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit... Um, as we read, uh, my personal c connections that I have with this book, um, my family history, my, my ancestry. Um, so I feel a lot of close ties with this book. This is by Donna Jo Napoli, by the way. Uh, the King of Mulberry Steep Street, excuse me, by Donna Jo Napoli. And uh, let me just jump into chapter one and uh, hopefully keep following along. Um, like I said, I'll share a little bit as we go, but let's just get to know the setting and the characters here in chapter one. Chapter one is called Surprise. I woke to Mama's singing in the kitchen. I pulled the sheet off my head. Mama had tucked it over me to keep out mosquitoes and malaria. The room was stifling. I got up from my bed of two chairs pushed together and opened the shutters. I straddled the windowsill, one leg dangling out, and savored the fresh air. In the alley below, mothers hurried along on errands. I hoped someone would see me, the brave boy on the sill, so I could wave. A child from the market walked beneath me with a basket of flat, bean, flat beans on his head. They looked good. There was a saying that no one starved in farmlands. My city, Napoli, was surrounded by farmlands, yet we'd been hungry for months. People went to bed trying not to think of food. Maybe Mama sang toward, to ward off that empty feeling. So real quick, right away, we know about the characters in the setting that this is um, that this character is living in poverty. Uh, even from just that subtle line, I got up from my bed of two chairs pushed together. Um, but it's also talking about hunger. Um, so just a nice little quick detail there to show us where we're at here. Um, Mom is saying to ward off that empty feeling. I looked back into the room at Uncle Aurelio and Aunt Sarah's bed. Baby Daniela's cradle sat on the floor. Aunt Rebecca, a widow, and my little cousins Luigi and Ernesto slept in another big bed. Uncle Vittorio snored in the cot farthest from the kitchen, our other room. He cleaned streets, a night job, and slept by day. I was nine, the oldest child in our home. Before I was born, a diphtheria outbreak killed all the other children and one aunt. So our friends celebrated at my birth. My grandmother, Nona, told me they roasted a goat. They celebrated even though Mama had no husband, and I was illegitimate. Nona was the tenth person in our home. In winter, we crowded into the kitchen to sleep around the oven. But the rest of the year, the kitchen was known as at night. Her cot was beside the credenza with the mirrored doors and lion feet that Grandfather had carved. She said his spirit lived in it, and she slept in the kitchen to be near him. She also slept there so she could protect our home. She was tiny, but she knew dozens of charms against evil. Now, baby Daniela made gulping noises. Aunt Sarah scooped her from the cradle with one arm and rolled onto her side to nurse. I got down from the window and walked into the kitchen to find warm bread on the table. Mama kissed me, her anise seed breath mixing with the smell of the bread. Beniam Beniamino, mio tesoro, my treasure. She fit my yarmulke on my head, and we said prayers. Then she tore a hunk off the loaf for me. I chewed in bliss. The yarmulke is uh, that little Jewish cap. The spelling of that may throw you off, but it is yarmulke. Nona's slow footsteps came up the stairs, and I ran to open the door. She handed me a full basket of clothes. Mama got up in surprise. For Sarah? And you, said Nona with reproach in her voice. Mama wiped a drop of coffee from her bottom lip. I'm going to find an office job, she said in a flat tone. Soon someone will hire me. Then you'll all be glad. Marjorie, said Nona. It was one of her favorite words. It meant if only that were true. In the meantime, she jerked her chin toward the basket. Aunt Sarah took in clothes for mending. At least, she used to. Lately, it seemed that people couldn't afford it. She'd be happy for this pile of work. Mama motioned to me to set the basket under the table. How did you collect so much? She asked Nona. 
I was early and beat the competition. You don't have to go out that early, said Mama. You don't have to work so hard at your age. Mar- Marjari, Marjari, excuse me, which was the phrase, uh, if only that were true. Majari. Nona dropped onto a bench with an oof. Maybe I'll crochet today. Nona made baby clothes to sell at Hanukkah and Christmas. It was my job to keep her yarn balls in order, piled just right. I went toward the yarn cabinet. Mama caught my arm. Get ready, we're going out. Her smile surprised me. The night before, I'd heard her crying quietly in the dark. I raced into the corridor to the water closet we shared with the neighbors on our floor. When I came back, I heard Nona say, Give up this idea of an office job. No doctor or lawyer will hire an unwed mother and a Jewess at that. To greet clients and keep records, you should work in a restaurant cleaning up. Mama said, You don't know. People will appreciate how well I read if they'll only give me a chance. They hushed when I came in, as though they thought I didn't know it was my fault Mama couldn't get an office job. But right now, that didn't upset me. Mama was in a good mood, and errands were fun. I pulled my nightshirt off, and Nona folded it, while Mama held out my day shirt and pants to step into. As we went through the doorway, Mama's fingertips grazed the box mounted on the doorframe that held the mezuzah. She boosted me up so I could touch it, too, though I scarcely looked at it. I didn't need its reminder, for I knew the most powerful one was unique and perfect. A mezuzah, just so you know, was kept on uh, the doorframe outside of Jewish households, um, and it has um, uh, scripture inside, um, kind of to show the house is, is blessed. Uh, our, al- our alley opened onto the Via dei Trabinali. Pardon my terrible Italian attempts. Uh, Our alley opened onto the Via dei Trabinali, full of merchants and buyers and laborers on their way to work. Men hooted obscenely and called things to Mama as we passed. This happened to any woman alone. The prettier she was, the worse it got. Mama was beautiful, so I was used to this. But I still hated it. Heat went up my chest. Even nine-year-olds knew those words. I glanced up at her, wanting to apologize for not being big enough to make them stop but she didn't seem offended. She never did. She neither slowed down nor sped up, her leather shod feet making quick slaps, my bare ones silent. Mama pointed at a small boy in the Pizza Dante. That's Tonino's son, she said. Tonino just sent money in a letter from America. That spring, Tonino had left for America, where everyone got rich. Good, I said. Will they join him there now? Not yet. He hasn't made much money. Mama's hand tightened around mine. But he will. He works in a coal mine. He turned down, or excuse me. We turned left down the wide Via Toledo. Gold numerals on black marble over the doorways told when the fancy shops were founded. Through glass windows, I saw carved pictures, frames, and chandeliers and shiny dresses. We passed a store filled with artificial roses, camellias, carnations, dahlias. Mama hesitated at the flower shop. I smiled up at her, but she stared at nothing, as though she was about to weep. Then she turned quickly and moved on. Watch where you walk, she said. The streets were dangerous for my bare feet. I looked down. Mama went into a cobbler's. That was odd. We never bought outside our neighborhood. From the doorway, I peered into the cool dark. She talked to a man at a workbench, cutting leather with giant scissors. He hugged her. She rested herself free and beckoned to me. The man shook my hand and went into a back room. Mama called. Wrap them, please. They're a surprise. A surprise? I perked up. Come look first, he answered. It'll only take a minute. I waited while she went into the back. She came out carrying a parcel wrapped in newsprint tied with a yellow string. The man handed me a licorice. We continued down via Toledo. I watched that surprise package. Mama held it in the, la- in the hand farther from me, and when I changed to her other side, she, li- she shifted the package to her other hand. It became a game, both of us laughing. Mama turned right toward our synagogue. Napoli had only one synagogue and no Jewish neighborhood. Uncle Aurelio said the Jews of Napoli were the world's best-kept secret. The Spanish had kicked them out centuries before, but no matter how many times they were kicked out, they always snuck back. 
We were as proud of being Jewish as of being Neapolitani. My cousins were named after famous Jews, Luigi after Luigi Lizzotti, and Venetian, the first Jewish member of the House of Parliament, Ernesto after Ernesto Natan, one of Roma's most important businessmen. Uncle Aurelio lectured us cousins on the possibilities, la possibilità. You can do anything if you put your heads to it and work hard. It doesn't matter what adversity comes. We are Jews, Neapolitani Jews. We never miss a beat. At the Piazza dei Martiri, I climbed over the fence onto the back of a stone lion. Other kids' mothers didn't let them, but Mama said that if the city didn't want kids playing on the lions, they shouldn't make statues just the right size for climbing on. We turned down the alley a cappella vecchia and into the courtyard. Napoli's buildings were mostly three or four stories high. Around this courtyard, though, the buildings had five floors. Passing under the thick stone arch, I felt as though we were leaving the ordinary and coming into some place truly holy. I love this courtyard, I said. Mama stopped. More than you love the synagogue itself? I didn't want to answer. Maybe my preference for the openness of the courtyard meant there was something lacking in my soul. She squatted, put a pinch of anise seeds in my palm, and looked up into my face as I chewed them. Stand here and think of why you love this place. Then go spend the day doing exactly what you want. She straightened up. What do you mean? Usually my family needed me to run errands. Visit all your favorite places and please visit Uncle Aurelio and Aunt Rebecca at work. She put her hands on my cheeks. I don't have money for you, but don't go home to eat at midday because if you do, Nona or Aunt Sarah might give you a chore. No chores today. See Napoli. See all that you love. I nodded in a daze of happiness. I would visit Aunt Rebecca at midday. She was a servant to a rich family and she always snuck me meat from their table. Stay well. You know how to be careful. I'll see you at dinner time. She kissed my forehead. Stay well, Mia Tesoro. All right, that was chapter one of uh, The King of Mulberry Street. and kind of paints a picture here of uh, um, our main character, Benny, Ama, or Benny Amino. I always have a hard time with that. Um, so we get to know the character a little bit. Why do you think his mom is, um, what do you think the surprise is for him that she's carrying um, that they picked up from the cobbler? And uh, why do you think she, she she tells him kind of take a day off of errands and go out and see uh, um, Napoli? Um, why do you think that might be? Predictions. Um, we got to see a little bit of setting and we really kind of got to know our character and, and his background, where he comes from. Um, keep following along. I'll post chapter two shortly. And um, I'm sure you're going to enjoy this one. This is, again, one of my favorites. King of Mulberry Street by uh, Donna Joe Napoli. All right. Peace.